What do you mean, what is GitHub? It's the largest, most complete development platform in the world. Millions of developers use it. And it's not just developers. These days, every company is a software company. I thought you might say that. Come on, let me show you. GitHub is an enterprise transforming, startup launching, community driven, super secure, open source championing, cloud based platform. It's where the world builds software. We created algorithms and global businesses. We even went to Mars. Or, or at, at least, least our code, code did. did. Oh, yes. With GitHub, anything is possible. But how? Say this is Sanal, a senior software engineer, and this is her team's project on GitHub. Sanal and her team can create their own branches of code to work together in parallel. This is my branch, an alternate timeline where I can build, squash bugs, and safely experiment. There are communication and task delegation tools right next to my code. So when we're ready to merge, we merge instantly. It works with thousands of branches for over a million projects. And with built-in project planning, automation, CI/CD, and AI-enhanced code editing at every step. You can move fast and get your ducks in a row. But we gotta be safe about it. GitHub has advanced security with automatic vulnerability detection, secret scanning, and more. So we can build and ship safely and securely. So, now you know what GitHub is, you might wonder who GitHub is. It's a student learning to code. It's disruptors revolutionizing music. It's a CEO transforming a global company. It's 21,000 strangers working together to take the first picture of a black hole. It's a place for anyone from anywhere to build anything. Anything you think the world needs. Pretty cool. Seeing all the work that people do on GitHub is always the most inspiring thing about the universe. But hey, Stormy, what else has been happening? Good morning, universe. Wow, it feels great to be back in person. And to those of you joining us online, I hope to see you in person soon. I'm Stormy Peters, and I'm VP of Communities at GitHub. But most importantly, I'm a developer who believes in changing the world. You, me, and everyone joining online, we're here because we understand the power of open source. We believe in its ability to change lives and shape the future. And we believe in the impact that we can create together as a community. I remember the early days of open source. Maybe you do too. We didn't always have so many people who believed in this way of working. 20 years ago, I was sitting in a standards meeting for HP when I realized that all of us, everyone sitting at the table, was working on the exact same thing. Different implementations of the same functionality. And I thought, there has got to be a better way, a more efficient way of doing things. And it turns out there was. That's when I discovered open source software, specifically the GNOME project. I just had to convince our leadership that it was safe to use. I had to convince them in the early adoption stages that this collaboration model was actually better. That developers working together provided better results for everyone. I convinced my company, and that launched my career, introduced me to a ton of awesome people, and I've been in love with the open source software community ever since. Fast forward to this very moment, and what we always dreamed of as a community is now actually happening. There's great trust in open source. And the code we're building is powering the people and infrastructure behind some of the greatest innovations of our time. Because of open source, 
we now have images of the black hole and the code to further its exploration. Because of open source, tools like Copilot and Hey GitHub are breaking barriers and expanding who gets to be a developer. It gives them access to development environments and even writes code for them. Because of open source, companies like Glia are helping create 3D prints of stethoscopes and face masks that provide affordable equipment for medical professionals around the world. Because of each of you, we're changing the world one line of code at a time. Yeah. Open source has achieved all of this and will continue to help humanity make great strides of progress because it's more available to everyone. Tools like Codespaces bring the development environment to almost anyone, anywhere, from your desktop to your local library. For example, a student in Uganda can take their development environment from the school to their cousin's computer to the coffee shop, learning to code wherever possible. Projects like GitHub Education are onboarding people to the world of open source, empowering students everywhere who want to become developers. This low barrier to entry means people from every corner of the world, from different socioeconomic backgrounds, can participate in some of the greatest achievements in history. People like you, me, and everyone online can be parts of moments much larger than ourselves. Today, I want to celebrate all the success we have helped achieve as a community and to inspire us to keep building, keep changing lives, and keep changing the world together. Today, more than 100 million people are fleeing war and persecution, pursuing freedom, protection, and the rights we all deserve. The war in Ukraine is a harsh reminder of deep-rooted division. However, in the midst of tragedy, we've gotten small reminders of what happens when we all come together. Mothers are leaving strollers at the border. People are offering housing. This type of collaboration, humanity coming together during the darkest hours, also takes place in technology. While not always visible, open source is making a difference in lives around the world. Organizations like the Norwegian Refugee Council are protecting and supporting millions displaced by the war in Ukraine, and they're using open source software to do it. Last year, our social impact team partnered with the NRC to help solve some information security issues and protect the personal data of people forced to flee. Little did we know how timely this collaboration was. Let's take a look at how the NRC is powering life-saving solutions and bringing hope to those who need it most. The NRC, or the Norwegian Refugee Council, is an independent humanitarian organization that works to uh, respond to the needs of those forced to flee, uh, usually conflict and persecution. And over time, we help them rebuild their future in a new way. We do it in 35 countries. And then, of course, the big response right now and the big focus is on Ukraine. A number of years ago, we decided to build a team inside of NRC that sort of broke the tradition of we need something, let's go out and tender for it, let's go out and buy it. But we believe that there were problems that we need to solve that the private sector and the tech companies that build the private sector don't usually do this. And so we build what we call a D team, a developer team. We based it in Berlin, although now it's expanding. The way we see it gives us a lot of flexibility and freedom, gives us granularity of control. So without the open source community, we would be missing the freedom and the ability to meet our needs from our perspective and devise solutions that are true to how we work and how we think and how we prioritize needs. Another great potential for the open source approach is that we can not just replicate this, but open it up for others. But often they are very resource constrained. And so they would never have a development team in-house. They would never have the ability to even buy proprietary software at scale. So how about NRC develop solutions that then can be opened up to the international humanitarian community. The work that we do is really about people. Let's not forget that. We work with displaced populations, with refugees, people on the move, people trying to find for them and their kids a better life, a better future. And very often these people will end up in our communities. I think it starts there for us as individuals, 
to have that open eye in our communities. I think that that's where it starts. Then, of course, if you want to help organizations like NRC, please do it. We always can do with more funding, with more partnerships, with more brain power. But I think we all have a role to play in our communities, and that's where I would start. That openness to those who are different, to those who don't speak our language, to those who went through incredible journeys that we can't even imagine to get to where they are. And they are strangers. They don't know anybody. So a warm smile offering help to somebody who is in need, even answering somebody's question who doesn't speak your language in your community. I think that those are important things that we shouldn't forget. So please, wa please join me in welcoming Ben from the NRC to the stage. Hi, Ben. It's great to have you here today. Hi, Stormy. Thanks for having me today. We just saw a great video of the work the NRC does from Pietro. Can you tell us about your role at the NRC? Yeah, so I'm a software developer at the NRC. I joined NRC because I spent my years building up my engineering skills, and I wanted to use those skills to help make the world a better place. At the NRC, I work on our internal development team, where we build our critical systems, as well as helping to foster strong engineering practices across the organization. As well as this, we often assist with emergency response work. And this is where I'm spending a lot of my time at the minute, helping our cash distribution team in Ukraine. So, so you're, you're giving cash from people that volunteered money to those that need it in Ukraine. That, that is so awesome. Can you tell us what's different about Ukraine than other projects that you've worked on in the past? Yeah, so one of the key methods of aid used by NRC and other humanitarian organizations is cash-based intervention. With cash-based intervention, we're actually directly giving money to displaced populations rather than providing the services ourselves. This allows us to help stimulate local economies and provides a certain level of dignity to people going through an incredibly difficult period in their lives. Typically, when we provide this aid, we're connecting with people face-to-face -face and actually giving them the cash, but we've done things a little differently in Ukraine. The interesting thing with Ukraine is the community is a high, digital, high level of digital literacy. Because of this, we've deployed a two-way communication system called the Digital Communities Hub. With this, we partnered with WhatsApp and Twilio to allow beneficiaries to register via WhatsApp. With this, with this method of communication, we've managed to reach far more people than we ever could before, as well as reaching communities in hard-to-reach areas, such as regions controlled by Russia. It's really this method of communication and the scale of the operation that sets our work in Ukraine apart from previous efforts around the world. Yeah, I think this level of digital liter literacy that you talk about actually means that a lot of us in the room um, know people affected by Ukraine because they have a strong open source software community. Can you tell me about some of the, the challenges that you're experiencing right now? Yeah, definitely. I mean, war moves fast, and this has meant we've had to move very fast too. We didn't really have the time to build this perfect end-to-end -end automated system from day one. The initial problem we really faced was the scale of the data coming in it surpassed the capabilities of our existing tools like Excel. So when we did this first round of cash distribution, I was running some Python scripts just sitting on my laptop. It was really hacky, really rough around the edges. But by doing it this way, we cut weeks off the time taken to provide aid, meaning people had food and shelter faster than they would have otherwise. Once we had a little bit more time on our hands, we were able to iterate on this process and build out a more secure, scalable system that processed data in real time. Today, we're still facing a lot of these problems. Delivering aid in, the, in these situations is never easy, and it never will be easy. We want to automate more of the processes our staff are working on so that we can alleviate their time to focus on key problems as well as integrating more data into the system. All of this is being done with like, very limited resources, and this is why we rely heavily on the open source community as well as partner organizations like yourselves at GitHub. So I'm sure everyone in the room would love to hear more about how open source helps. Can you tell us about some of the tools and technologies that you use? Yes, definitely. Like we have three key modules to our system. On one end, we have our data collection tools. As I mentioned, this is using WhatsApp and Twilio, processed over 60 million messages through these platforms. On the other end, we have our cash distribution partners, such as Red Rose and MoneyGram. This is how we actually get the aid out to communities. But to bring this all together, we've built an automated data pipeline for this, we've primarily been using Python because the open source community behind Python is just incredible. And it's really become the standard for data engineering these days. The Python community is great. 
Yeah, it's absolutely fantastic. Like we've been using libraries like Pandas to clean, score, and evaluate our data at the scale we need. And then when it came to deploying it, we used an open source data orchestration platform called Dagster. This allowed us to schedule, monitor, and automate our pipeline in a reproducible environment. After this, our staff needed to actually interact with the data. So we partnered with an open source CRM tool called Corteza. Mm -hmm. With Corteza, we're able to model our data, gain insights into it, and codify some of our business processes in their low code workflow to then integrate with the cash distribution partners. Outside of this, there was um, one other tool that was particularly, honestly, life-changing for me, and this is GitHub Copilot. We've heard a lot oh. about it this week, and it literally was the second developer sitting next to me. As I mentioned before, we've been massively underfunded for this project. We didn't have the engineering capacity to run this kind of thing, so having Copilot with me really helped me increase my velocity. By focusing on the architecture of the system and not the syntax of a for loop, I could really spend my time where it was most needed, and I just kept pressing tab for the rest. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear it helped. I'm glad to hear it helped you and the, and the folks in Ukraine. Um, so I'm sure people here are happy to hear that they've already helped um, with the crisis in some way through the open source software that they've developed. How could we help more? Yeah, so there's a few ways people can help. With Ukraine specifically, donations are at the core of what we do. They provide food for people, they provide shelter for people, but they also fund our internal development efforts like we've been talking about today. Everything I've spoke about today is being built purely by caffeine. So if you'd like to buy me a coffee or two, there's a QR code behind me, <laughs> and that will take you to our donations page in Ukraine. We're also hiring for a lot of roles in Ukraine, so if you'd like to get more directly involved with the team, please check out the NRC careers page, and hopefully you'll find a role that matches your skill set. But the thing is, the crisis in Ukraine isn't the only crisis happening in the world right now. It's not the first, and it's definitely not going to be the last. What we need is help from you during peacetime. If we can build these solutions during peacetime, we can be ready for the next crisis on day one and provide aid as soon as possible. Outside of this, if there's any individuals out here today or any organizations who think they can help in any way whatsoever, please just reach out to me personally, and I'll make sure your resources are used in the most effective way possible. So thanks, Ben. You heard, buy him a coffee if you see him around. Um, Thank you for all your work on the open source software that has supported this effort and helped people fleeing um, from Ukraine. And please continue to do great work on open source software. Thanks, Ben, so much for sharing the story and for the great work you've Thanks, done. Thanks, Stormy. Thank you, everyone. COVID is now a lived reality. But for a moment, let's think about the very be beginning of the pandemic. Who knew where we would end up? There were empty shelves and streets, packed hospitals, and millions of lives changed forever. Every day, our eyes are glued to the phone, waiting for the latest update or any new data or breakthrough. While we were grappling with the pandemic, countries and their governments looked to the World Health Organization. And during one of the most pressing health crises of our time, the World Health Organization looked to open source. At the height of the pandemic, the agency used open source software to build tools, fill information gaps between countries and governments. You can imagine how important that was and still is as we continue to navigate COVID. Earlier this year, the World Health Organization launched an open source program office, the very first to be created in the United Nations system. With this office, the organization is creating global communities, contributing back to science, and building models that scale open source across public health. Joining me today is Samuel Mambuthia, who is leading this work at the World Health Organization. Please welcome me, please welcome me, please, no, please join me in welcoming Sam to the stage. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Thank you. So you're now running the open source program office at the World Health Organization. That's right. Can you tell us a little bit about the career path that gets you there? I'm sure people would be interested in learning. 
Yeah, sure. Um, so I started off as a developer in Kenya, mm -hmm. uh, using open source libraries, open source frameworks to build uh, different things. And I, I, like, it was a great experience for me to have these tools that were built by other people that I could use to make my work better, to save, save on time, and so on. Um, later, I joined a nonprofit called Medic Mobile. Uh -huh. And this is an organization that builds tools for health workers uh, in hard to reach areas in Kenya, across Africa, and, and some parts of Asia. And um, through this process of building tools, I got to be at the forefront of building a community of practice, an open source community of practice around the platform that we were developing. And so that, that's basically how I got here. That's really awesome. Yeah. Um, and, and so it sounds like you've had some experience with open source software in the health industry. Can you tell us more about how you see open source software helping the health industry or? What yeah. that looks like? Yeah, um, so I think uh, there, there are a few areas that you could look at, a few examples that I could use when, when talking about something like that. Uh, one is uh, the tools that we're building for community health workers in Kenya and uh, in Africa. Uh, were a lot of them that are built using open source uh, software can be scaled very easily because there are so many other organizations that can take those same tools and build the same applications in, in different places. Mm -hmm. And then the other area is uh, with organizations that focus on health, they may not have the technical teams, like the large technical teams that uh, would normally be in big tech companies. And because of that, they're able to leverage open source communities to build and make their, their tools and software better and have them have the great impact that they're having right now. That, that's awesome to hear. Um, I, I, know you're, I know you're new in your role, I, I, just a couple months, right? Yes. Um, but can you tell us about what you'll be doing and what you see the open source program office like doing? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, well, the first two months have been just trying to find my, my bearing, yeah. uh, trying to understand the organization. It's a, it's a huge organization with a lot of complex things happening, a lot of policies, a lot of uh, things that, that in, in some ways could restrict open source. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're looking at having ways of opening uh, things up, having a culture shift from uh, this closed, uh, some, somewhat... Uh, uh, away from open source culture to something that opens up to uh, co collaborating with other organizations, collaborating with other institutions to work together on software. Oh. So this has happened in the past uh, with COVID, there were open source tools that were developed. Um, moving forward, we have the uh, WHO Hub for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence that focuses on collaborative intelligence. And a lot of this is going to be uh, anchored on open source tools, open source softwares, and open source communities. Very cool. And, and why, you talked a little bit about the benefits of open source in, in, early in your career, but why open source now? Like how is, it, how is it helping in the health industry? And do you think what you're doing at the World Health Organization will set an example for other, other health agencies? Yeah, um, that, that's, that's a good question. Um, in, in, in some research, the research that was done, uh, I think last year with uh, GitHub Tech for Social Good team, mm -hmm. um, the Open source was seen as a key thing in reducing duplicative efforts in, in health uh, software, particularly in public health. And with open source, then you don't need to create something that's already been created. You can take something that's out there and use it um, fairly quickly to, to get um, something to respond to a health emergency. And so having these ways of, of working together as, as a global community and as open source communities then makes it faster to respond to health emergencies. Um, there are other initiatives that are being set up to work together. Um, one is on, on using open um, uh, internet sources to try and detect the next pandemic before it happens. Very cool. And we need uh, more tools to make this better. Things like uh, detecting the, the, the authenticity of, of the information that's out there. There's a lot of uh, fake news and, and a lot of other things that could be noise and would not be able to tell you when the next pandemic is happening. But if we have the right people working on tools to make this better, then we have a way to hopefully detect the next pandemic before it happens or in very early in the, in the pandemic so that we can stop the, the harmful effects before they, they get too bad. We would all love to see that, I'm sure. I, I know that like when COVID um, first hit, a lot of people in the room started working, trying to help because we saw a huge uptick in open source software projects that were trying to find solutions to COVID, trying to parse the data like you said and share it. Um, what could we do now if we wanted to help? Yeah, um, I think uh, right now we have the different uh, 
open source projects, open source communities that we're trying to set up. And we need everyone who's interested or anyone who's interested to, to express that interest. And so that we can understand how we can bring people on board, we can have institutions, organizations working together with us on this. Um, and it, it's a matter of reaching out. Uh, we have a discussion, a discussions, a GitHub discussions board where we are trying to get people to, to express their interests, share their stories, um, talk to us about uh, what they feel like they can, they can participate in. And I, I'm there and a few other people are there to just direct you to the right people, direct you to the right projects, and help us work together on these tools. And it's awesome you have GitHub discussions going for this. I look forward to joining you there, but what organization would I go to? Where, where do I go to find it? Oh, yeah. Um, so it's a World Health Organization GitHub uh, repository or GitHub oh. account. Oh. And right at the top, we have an uh, open source communication channel that's pinned right up there. So that's the repository you go to, and have the, we have the discussions both there. So we're not using the organization discussions. Uh, just, just to but just like, launched? Yeah, just yeah. launched, and, and we're just trying to, to get things a bit um, orderly before we move on. Yeah. Well, awesome. Thanks so much for the work you've done, and thanks for sharing your story with all of us. Um, hopefully, we'll join you there. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for having me. In times of crisis, we turn to entertainment and escapism, some way to transport to another space, time, and even dimension. One of my first experiences in open source was setting up large Linux clusters for animated film development before many knew what Linux was. Now open source is powering the worlds of our most beloved superheroes. Imagine Spider-Man swinging across New York City, or Doctor Strange opening mystical portals to different dimensions, or Neo rediscovering the truth of the matrix. Open source is bringing some of the most iconic cinematic moments to life. And these companies are coming together to build open source software solutions for animation and visual effects in organizations like the Academy Software Foundation. Engineers at leading production studios like Marvel and Pixar rely on ASF's open source software projects to bring some of our favorite movies to life. With open source, we're seeing developers at competing studios collaborate on the software that's fueling not just our favorite characters, but the next wave of cinema. I'm Rachel Rose. I'm an R&D supervisor at Industrial Light and Magic. At a place like ILM, research and development, or R&D, is the group that is responsible for creating tools that our artists use to bring amazing images to the big screen. Many people are very surprised that we use code so much in the work that gets done on a day-to-day -day basis. If you were to just watch a movie, but you see your images and you're not seeing the code that sits behind it. As an industry, we rely on a lot of different applications. So we might do lighting in one tool and animation in another tool or digital modeling in another tool. But when you're done, you need to bring it all together. Different studios started open sourcing because they saw the value that it would bring to their own organization by having other places and other applications that were using those standards so that we would be able to exchange data. The ASWF is a foundation that was put together so that we could make both the quality and quantity of open source contributions better for our industry. It's a home for many of the most well-used open source projects within the industry. And by having open source projects, it makes it a lot easier for us to be able to share and collaborate. It has a huge impact on what we're able to do within the open source community. One of the pieces of technology that I work pretty heavily on at ILM is StageCraft, which is a tool for doing virtual production on very large LED stages. The great thing about that technology is that we were able to pull a lot of it together very quickly, and a large part of that was the foundation. We also really want to bring together our community, and that's one thing that I think has been a overwhelming success. Our ASWF meetings have a representative from many of the biggest companies in visual effects and animation. And we're able to all sit in a room and collaborate on ideas that will benefit all of us. We have a lot of very powerful member companies. So with the might that those companies can bring, there is a chance of actually being able to affect diversity at some level. Maybe it's being able to increase diversity within our own organization, but it can also be to help inform and educate younger individuals who may not even know that this is a choice for their future career. 
You know, when I was a kid, I always loved Star Wars and Indiana Jones and all of the films that ILM is so well known for. And I guess I never realized that this was something that I could do. And I often find that there are a lot of people that are very interested in that mix of art and science. There are careers out there that mix that art and science very heavily and you have the ability to use your scientific skills in a way that will affect the art. A really important aspect of what we're doing in open source is bringing together a large community who can contribute a large number of ideas. So we want those ideas to be diverse and that comes from a diverse set of individuals. We can be more innovative because we have a foundation that we can trust and we're putting work into it. We're sharing that work across a larger number of people. It actually was a dream job to work on The Mandalorian, and it's one of those opportunities that you don't get very often to be doing really forward-thinking technology that you see a very dramatic effect of how it changes the industry in a short period of time. We knew in the foundation that we had within the industry, including the Open Source Foundation, was very key to making it successful. When we think of open source, we think of software, but it's also part of the hardware world. Recently, I was trying to buy gifts for a couple of friends in open source who are expecting babies, and when I Googled open source baby, I got back tons of open source health monitoring systems for babies. I didn't buy them a hospital system, but I did learn something that day. The hardware we use daily is a great reminder of how we're integrating open source into our lives from baby monitors to household appliances and even robots. Many of the robots you see today are powered by the robot operating system, which is completely open source. This powers hundreds of different types of robots, from your vacuum cleaner, one of my favorite gadgets, who hasn't watched the map to figure out where it's gonna go next, to NASA's Robot2, Robonaut2, sorry, a humanoid robot built to help our astronauts work and explore in space. When you start to have robots interacting with humans, you need vision systems to interact and detect where robots can safely operate. Moveit is an open source library for robot OS that sits between the cameras and the motors that power the robot. Companies like Picnic are shaping the future of this very thing, building and helping to maintain Moveit and robot OS. Let me introduce Dave Coleman, CEO of Picnic, to show us more. Please join me in welcoming Dave to the stage. <laughs> Hey, Dave, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. This is exciting. Super exciting. And I'm looking forward to seeing what you're doing. Yeah. So we know you're the CEO of Picnic. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got there? Like... Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, so it actually started when I was like middle school and I saw Star Wars. I heard that reference a few times already. Uh, I wasn't into lightsabers or the force. I loved the droids. And I decided cool. then at a young age that this would be my career. And you know, I was kind of dormant for a while, but I was then in grad school working my PhD. And I did an internship uh, here in the Bay Area at a place called Willow Garage that had a dramatic impact on the robotics industry because they were so into open source. They spun out a bunch of different projects, uh, particularly uh, Ross, like you mentioned, and MoveIt. And so I, I was there, and I've been involved with uh, MoveIt ever since. And so Ross is like the, uh, the, the middleware that connects and makes robots compatible all over the world. So it's like all, all the companies use it. And, and MoveIt's like the killer app. I, I, that's maybe that's we, we don't want robots that kill people. It's the most popular app <laughs> in this ecosystem for making robot arms uh, usable in our everyday lives. Um, and, and so this, the, the applications and industries it's been work, I mean, used in is, is incredible from uh, you know, unloading boxes and trucks, is, trucks, subsea infrastructure maintenance, uh, fast food robots that are you know, changing the way we do kitchens. Uh, and one that I really particularly love is here in California, there's robots running open source software outdoors in strawberry fields, picking strawberries. Fresh robot pick berries are delicious. They, they don't like squish the, ro the strawberries? Not, not usually. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah, I was looking back at my emails preparing for this, and I saw like, the email from 2012 when uh, someone emailed saying, hey, we're switching to this cool thing called GitHub. So it's, it's oh, been around awesome. for a long time, and it's been cool to be part of that community. Very cool. And you told me you were going to introduce me to a friend while we're here. Uh, yeah, yeah. So over here we have uh, Hal, the uh, six-axis robot arm. Say <laughs> hi to the audience, Hal. Um, this is, uh, you know, typically we've seen robots like this used in factory settings. Hi, Hal. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, we're working on making robots be doing way more than what we can do in factories. 
So how like sees us? It, it sees us, exactly, yeah. So uh, it takes depth sensors, kind of like we see in the self-driving car industry, to uh, see the world and create like an artificial representation internally that it understands and can then automatically plan um, based on what it sees. Whereas traditional robots, they're just doing the same rote thing over and over again. They're, they're not very flexible. We want this to work in uh, unstructured environments, we call it. So this is kind of uh, things that are changing. I could jump in front of it and it could adapt, right? And we do that using a lot of sophisticated algorithms. Um, through, through Move It? Through, through Move It, yeah, the open source software. Uh, the, the, the research community has been really big into this. There's been like almost 1,000 publications using, of researchers using Move It uh, for their work. Um, and so uh, one of the key things, so we, we use like inverse kinematics, uh, computer vision to understand the world, but also uh, the search space for planning an arm is infinitely large. It turns out that the number of configurations in continuous space is enormous. And so if we want to plan around obstacles, we actually have to discretize the world, but also use a thing called like probabilistic sampling-based motion planning. And uh, it's, it's so, so you're trying to figure out like the possibility that there might be something there. Yeah, it's you're kind of guessing, guessing and checking, and it, it turns out to be a really uh, great way to do this. We've been using it. The, the academic community we've been working on this for the past couple decades, and it's basically rolling a dice really fast and just hoping that it finds the solution. So uh, on top of that, we're applying um, more machine learning methods for picking up arbitrary objects, um, even downright quacky ones. <laughs> Whoa! Uh, yeah, thank you, Hal. That's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> and he didn't squish the ducky. Yeah, ducky. No strawberry or ducky <laughs> squished snake. Yeah. Nice. Thank you, Hal. Um, so can you tell us if, if people wanted to get involved with the open source software project, how they would do that? Yeah. So uh, you know, we have a website, moveit.ross.org, uh, a vibrant community online. Um, and that community is something I'd love to chat about. Please. Uh, so, you know, this, the company that originally started this, and I was involved in it, it long ago shut down, like 2013, but the industry and research organizations and group all over the world have continued its growth, maintaining it, adding new features. And so Picnic Robotics has been, uh, the company I represent, has been really involved in leading that. We, we do that through hosting um, international hackathons, cool. uh, keeping the tutorials and documentation super important to be up to date, workshops at conferences, uh, as well as even, uh, we have this software called the Setup Assistant. It takes a CAD of your robot, so any, when you support any kind of robot, you can quickly set up your robot to then run using Move It and ROS, which is something really powerful. And then how do you think like open source and robots like how, like how are they, how are they changing the industry? Yeah. Uh, I love or the that world, question. like I, I actually think it's, they're changing the world, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think it's just, it's been incredible. The, the impact that Move It has had on the industry and, and Ross and the, the speeding up that we see of the adoption. So huge tech companies use our software. Uh, Amazon, Google, Facebook, startups everywhere are, are making these uh, you know, big technological advances by building on top of this, raising all this money, medium-sized businesses. One thing that's particularly uh, you know, important to me is its usage on the International Space Station. And, you, know, you had a slide earlier yeah, about that. Um, really cool. Yeah, like Picnic, where we're bringing more and more open source robotic software to the future space missions, to the future space stations that are you know, being launched this decade. And I, I just, being the Star Wars geek that I, I came as, like, I think that's so cool. And it just gets me really stoked. Um, but I, you know, our mission's way bigger than these big logos I just named. Um, I, I really believe that robotics is, is going to have this huge, huge impact in this decade on our lives. It's been, it started since the Industrial Revolution, but uh, it's continuing on now. And the, the impact on the abundance, the economic abundance it can bring to us to make our lives better is, is profound. And it does that through basically making society more efficient so that we can make goods cheaper and have more interesting, less mundane jobs, right? So like my robot vacuum cleaner cleans my floors so that I can spend more time on open source software. Exactly, yep. <laughs> I love my vacuum cleaner too. Um, and, and so the, the key though is that there's a lot of power in this economic abundance we're creating. And how do we uh, make it so that not just a few big companies have access to the, this world changing thing, but to like how can we democratize that? And clearly like open source is the way we're doing that. So like that's to me really, really important that, uh, that the software we're developing, Move It, is, is made by people for people um, to make kind of uh, to make the robotics abundance that we have in front of us accessible in the next decade. Yeah, and, and people around the world can adapt it to their needs. So like it might pick strawberries in California and peaches in Colorado or, yeah. 
all, countries all over the world are using this. Yeah. So yeah, Very cool. I encourage you to you know, go to our website. There's a big Get Involved button. Talks about how to contribute at different levels based on your skill set. We try to make sure beginners can use it as well as like, uh, experts. Thanks very much, Dave. Yeah. That is awesome. Thanks, Hal. Thanks for having me. <laughs>
do their own patches and their own piece of software to get to the specific calibration for their specific science case. But again, it's open source, so people can take it and suggest algorithms and code for us. Without open source, I don't see it working. Open source is necessary, especially because it's getting more and more complex. So not everybody's an expert on everything. You need the expertise from other people, and how do you share code if it's not out there? There is a lot that the community can contribute, not just the people in the building, not just the people at uh, ESA or CSA or SCCI or NASA. There are so many young developers out there with bright ideas. We need to get those ideas and give values to those ideas and open source help us to do that. This type of astronomical exploration is just the latest in many recent examples of how open source takes us beyond what we know today. And how a single contribution from a developer like you can make what we currently think impossible, possible. Nearly a century ago, Albert Einstein predicted there were such things as black holes. But he had no way to prove that they existed. Now, with support from the open source software community, the Event Horizon Telescope captured the very first picture of a black hole in 2019. While some of these things can seem huge and impossible to achieve on our own, it's important to remember that when we all come together and collaborate, like we have in the open source software world, we can discover the next big thing together. Things that could take a lifetime can be developed in a decade with many working together. Along with visualizing the previously unknown, when we work together, we can push the limits of what's possible outside of our world as well. Just last year, 12,000 developers on GitHub contributed to code that aided in the first flight on another planet with Ingenuity. Open source projects like SciPy, Linux, and F Prime were a part of the list of projects that NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab team used to achieve flight on Mars. These are projects you can contribute to today. That's the amazing opportunity we have as developers doing what we love to do most, code. One of the first open source software developers I met told me that the code he wrote was on the Hubble telescope. He was so proud that his code was in outer space. And you too can do the same. Today we started here on Earth solving some of the most complex problems we have as a human race, conflict and health, and ended up in outer space, in galaxies searching for exoplanets we don't yet know. The future of open source is bright. Just look at what we've achieved in the last 20 years. As our community and challenges continue to evolve, I ask you to consider the role that you will play. What will you build? How will you contribute? What will you achieve? The world depends on open source, and open source depends on you. And we don't have to do this alone. Let's build from here together. Thank you. <laughs>